in the summer, and they're not necessarily losing it when they go back to school. The, the, the rate of increase is just declining a bit. So I wanted to talk about that and look at some of the data around it, some of the reasons for it, and then some potential solutions to help prevent it. Um, yeah, this is just not All right, working. so I have your old so, PowerPoint up here, so you can go ahead and go through that. Okay, well, I don't have it, so I have to get it from your <laughs> email. Um, oh, I didn't email it to you. <laughs> I just No, you up. did a few days ago. Oh, that would be Clancy. Um, yeah, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Clancy did a few days ago. So um, hold on for one second. Here it is. Okay, it's trying to open. Could not open file. Um, I apologize for this. So, do you want me to describe for you what's on the first slide? No. <laughs> it's a picture of a child. I don't know. Right? <laughs> you know, the oh. other out, Kathleen, is that, you know, sometimes things aren't worth salvaging. So, the other possibility is that we just um, cancel for today. So, that's also an option because we have a point of um, we don't want to do other people's presentations. So, and if it's I know. Like, like you're not able to see what you're presenting on, um, then that might not be the best use of everyone's time this morning, this afternoon already. Yeah. How about you give me one more minute and see what I can come up with. Um, I have a plan B. Let's see. No. So those of you who haven't participated in telehealth sessions before, we don't usually have <laughs> this much trouble with connectivity, but sometimes it happens. <laughs> and okay, I it. think I have it. Okay. <laughs> I think. So it's called Summer Weight Gain. That's it. Okay, and there are 28 slides. There may be. I didn't count them. Okay. So the first slide is a Time magazine. That's mm -hmm. the one. Okay. Okay. So this is kind of cute. Um, it shows a kid, a big kid, having a double scoop on a very slanted skateboard. Um, and it's, the title is Our Supersized Kid. That was my attempt to be funny, but I'm no longer worried about that. So um, when we talk about childhood overweight, regardless of the time of year, it's all about energy in and energy out. Um, unfortunately, it's not quite that simple because there's a lot of other things that play into why we eat, how we eat, and what we eat, and what we do with what we eat. Um, but it's a nice little slide that there should be a balance. Um, this next slide looks at a, a, a study that was done in um, pediatrics of adolescent medicine looking at 17 medical middle school children and following them um, from when they entered a classroom, they have different ages, so different classes, what happened to their weight during that year, and what happened to their weight during that summer until the next year. And you can actually see in the first um, graph that weight goes down um, significantly from 37 kilograms to 35 kilograms during the fall or when they're in school. And then during the summer, between spring and fall of year two, weight goes up. Um, and the slope of that weight is shown um, on the red line. Similarly, energy expenditure, uh, or VO2 max, declines during the spring and, during spring and summer, or the spring, summer break, um, compared to at baseline. 
So we're seeing weight gain with kids. Another study on the next slide looked at um, kindergartners who, again, went through kindergarten, had summer, and then entered first grade. So this is about a 21-month study. Uh, and it breaks it down into kids who were initially overweight and who were initially average. And we'll start with the average one. That's the dotted line. So during the school year, weight goes up slightly. But you can see that there's a big increase in the slope of that weight gain during the summer. And then it levels back off to this similar increase as the previous year. But what's happened is we missed the weight loss opportunity. And instead of having a constant weight gain, we had an accelerated weight gain during the summer months, 9 through 12. Unfortunately, in kids who are initially overweight, and not unfortunately, fortunately, kids who are initially overweight, they actually lose some weight during the school year, probably because of school lunch programs. Despite, our fact, despite the fact that we don't think that they're ideal, they're probably providing better nutrients, better energy-rich food, and lower calories than what kids are getting at home. And so you can see during the summer there is a huge spike or increase in their rate of obesity, which unfortunately does not then decline the next year. So everybody seems to be gaining weight. Those who are overweight to begin with have a worse problem during the summer months, um, but it's affecting everyone. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, then I'll move on to the next slide. Um, it also, the picture is, of course, a little bit worse because when we talk about people who are underrepresented or underserved, um, the situation is more dramatic. So this slide uh, breaks things down by um, kids of white ethnicity, black, and or, or Hispanic. And you can see that, again, it's a problem across the board um, with a little bit of increase in BMI in white kids between in, during the summer break. Uh, but it's much more pronounced in um, black kids or African-American kids and Hispanics. Um, and so, unfortunately, those two um, ethnicities slash races are higher to begin with but continue to rise. So definitely more of a problem with the underserved, um, but still a problem across the board. I don't have um, a slide, I don't have a graph of Native Americans because they weren't included in the study, but you can imagine it's pretty similar to Hispanics and blacks um, just due to demographics and other, other issues. So um, the next slide re-reviews our scale of um, possible causes of summer weight gain. And so we know it's energy in and energy out, but what's contributing to that? So are kids eating more? Less, or eating less healthy food with a more high caloric um, content and fewer nutritional values? Yes, probably. But physical activity and energy expenditure is still kind of a, a mystery, at least to me or it was before, because um, I remember growing up and having summer and all we did was go run from 8 a.m. until 9 p.m. when we finally kicked the can and went to bed. Cheapest game you can ever play. You have your bowl or your cup of chicken noodle soup and you take the can and you go out and play kick the can all night long. So why does this happen? Well, one, during the summer there is no physical activity designated. So even though we think that we don't have very good physical education in our school system because of um, things like no child left behind and needing to study for the test, um, Recesses have been diminished, as have um, uh, gym time. But there is some, and so some is better than none, right? Um, but during summer, there is no designated time, and so kids might become more sedentary, especially in the light of having TV, videos, iPods, um, easily accessible, so there's no real reason to go do anything, even if it's a beautiful day outside, um, the pod gets more importance. Uh, fine, and, and then 
Next is that um, particularly in single home families um, where mom or dad, whoever the single parent is, is working, and so there's no supervision of the kids, no rules on screen time, no outdoor time, and in fact, often the kids are just told to stay home, stay inside until I get back from work because it's not safe out there. Um, and so, again, that diminishes physical activity. On the flip side, um, there may be poor food quality. So we know that um, the more inexpensive foods are more high caloric, um, higher density of fat, lower density of nutrition, and they're cheaper. And kids like them. Uh, so donuts, potato chips, soda, um, and again, if you're there home, at home unsupervised, um, nobody's paying attention to what's going in. Um, so that's a big problem. And the next problem is kids don't make great choices, and again, they don't have that supervision or structure in which to make healthy choices uh, unless they're given that opportunity. Does anybody have any other thoughts about what might be contributing to this phenomenon? Nobody? Is anybody there? We're here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> At least you're still there. <laughs> okay. So then let's move on to talking about what can we do about this big problem. Um, and the next slide introduces a study called the Garden Fit Study. And it was a summer gardening intervention for kids who were overweight and they were middle school children. So they're between the ages of 12 and 14. Uh, and the purpose of the study was to do the following. Increase their consumption of fruits and vegetables, increase their physical activity through gardening, and increase their exposure to the knowledge of fruits and vegetables and their importance. The hypothesis was that the garden fit intervention will increase physical activity and provide increased access to healthy foods, thus reducing the trend of summer BMI increase or weight gain. On the next slide is just a couple of pictures of showing the kids doing their thing. They're digging trenches. Um, and then we've got some of the results on the, on the second picture of some of the products that they've produced. Um, and these kids aren't all grossly overweight, but they, they're, they're heavy. Um, and you can kind of see that from the pictures. They come from all different backgrounds. So they took 11 of these kids. They were enrolled in the, um, it was the Goodman Community Center Summer Program. And then they, felt they compared them to five kids um, just enrolled in a regular summer, summer program. They had to be overweight with a BMI greater than the 85th percentile. And they entered this eight-week gardening program. Uh, and the hours of their gardening program were Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 9 to 12, and Tuesdays and Thursdays from 9 to 12.30. And um, that extra half hour added a healthy lunch pre preparation uh, and eating, of course. So um, they did get some exposure to actually eating the foods that they, they um, created. The activities included digging, planting, weeding, watering, mulching, harvesting, cooking, and games. And they measured um, body composition through a variety of methods. They did some blood work looking at fasting insulin glucose, some measures of inflammation, C-reactive protein, and um, interleukin-6. They measured cardiovascular fitness through VO2 max. And they did questionnaires with the kids looking at what's your diet like, what is your food awareness and exposure. And they did this at the baseline um, in May at the beginning of the summer and at the end of August when this uh, summer ended and the program stopped. And the next slide looks at baseline data. Um, really not much exciting there. Um, pretty similar group, so we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, and this is just some examples of different individuals. Um, and what was interesting was that there was a wide variety of effects. Um, 
one kid gained three kilograms, um, but several others lost three kilograms. Um, and in the control group, I, I don't know why they just represented two patients here, but um, they, again, had a, a slight variation in results. Energy expenditure um, actually went down in the gardening group, which was really surprising to the um, authors of this article uh, for the most part. But it also went down in the control group. What they did find, though, was that there was a significant, on the next slide, a significant increase in uh, learning about new fruits and vegetables from baseline to um, uh, midsummer. Um, and so the questions that they asked were, I've never heard of this fruit or vegetable, so a significant improvement in those who have heard of it. I have heard of this but haven't eaten it. I have eaten this, but I didn't like it. Fortunately, that was unchanged, and more people tried something new and did like it. So that's good, and there were 32 different types of vegetables that they were growing in the garden, so it really did increase the kids' exposure um, to things. And then on the next slide, some of the challenges of this study were that um, there was limited control over what they eat and what they did outside of the program. So what they were doing at home. Again, it could have been those same things that were going on that contribute to childhood overweight and um, obesity during summer. And the variation of activity did vary some um, from day to day, and some activities were more intense or strenuous than others. And then there was individual variation in the, in the kids' motivation to actually participate and be engaged. So it was a pilot study, and it was a good effort. And unfortunately, as seen on the next slide, uh, this really does require a village. Um, you need to have engagement with the home, the parent, the child, the family. That's listed three times. The school, which is hard to do when it's summertime um, because there's no school unless they're in a, after, or a, a summer program, you need to really have the community involved. You need to have the healthcare system involved. You probably need to have local government, media, and restaurants all participating in making efforts to um, avoid weight gain, not only in summer, but all year long. Another study, which is on the next slide, called Shape Up Somerville. Uh, what they did was they recruited 90 teachers uh, it, who taught grades 1 through 3, uh, and um, they got actually got 81 of them. Uh, they participated in 100 community events and four. And there were well, I'm sorry, there were 100 community events and four parent forums. 50 medical professionals were trained to participate. 21 restaurants uh, agreed to participate, and 811 families were reached, um, as well as 353 community partners. Um, and over the course of this, they actually uh, reached out to 20,000 individuals and recruited 14 after-school programs. Uh, and what they did on the next slide is just sort of connecting all of the dots, community mapping of what resources are available, similar to what we have with Zip to Health or Zip Resources um, in, in several communities now. I believe we have... Help me out, someone. Albuquerque, Las Cruces, and now Roswell? Yeah, it, it's, that one's yet to be printed, but it's in its final stages. Gallup, Farmington, and Tucumcari, I think. Oh, great. And so what this is is a compendium of resources, which I believe you can get on our website. Um, in those communities, where's a good place to get good food, where's a good place to be physically active, what kind of activities can be done for low cost, et cetera, et cetera. So a complete resource of that one community, which it's really fabulous if you have an opportunity to take a look at it. Uh, so community mapping, participant assessment, and identifying par partners for individuals who may need that building capacity, actually making it happen, and then gathering information and delivering that information. All important models, all important aspects of community engagement. Next slide. Oh, I, don't, I have a next slide. 
Uh, oh, there's okay. some pop-ups. There's some pop-ups. I didn't realize that. Sorry. I didn't. While no, you, that's while okay. Oh, you were talking. I should have been doing that. I know. I should have done I didn't either, either. Anyway, so we'll move past those. There we go. All right. Now we're to a new step. Oh, and so then... Finally, it's listening, building relationships, and establishing trust, which is a really key thing to making any type of program like this successful. So, their results. After one year, um, mine are kind of blurry. What they found that was there was a significant effect in um, not weight loss, but preventing weight gain in these kids, which is really important. Our goal is not initially to prevent weight loss, it's to prevent weight gain because then they can grow into their bodies. And so there was a significant benefit in both boys and girls. Um, uh, in this study. And then another um, look at it on the next slide looks at the control group and their weight gain versus the intervention group and their weight gain um, from the beginning of summer to the end of summer. So the kids in the inter intervention group still gained weight, but the slope was dramatically decreased compared to those uh, in the control group. And so their rate of weight gain was much lower through their participation in the program. Okay, let's see. So other thoughts. Um, Definitely, I, I talked about if we do have these compendiums of resources that were largely developed by John Martinez and Carol Conley and others, um, and I believe you can access some of those resources as well as many other resources on the Envision website. Um, and I just put in, I think, we, I don't know if we need to retake roll call, but some of the uh, information and our website is on the last slide. I think that's the last slide. And then thank you for your patience and tolerance. So can so. you come bring up our website if you wanted to talk about it? Yeah. What's so that? I've got the website up. Um, so I'll okay. use it to health. Just to reiterate um, what Dr. Collin was saying, if you go to our website on the left side under special programs, you'll see ZIP. And this is our ZIP code to health. He has our four key messages, eat well, play hard, turn it off, and drink water. But the Zip to Health reinforces eating breakfast seven times, a, seven times a week or every morning, eating a minimum of five fruits and vegetables every day, reducing screen time, recreational screen time, not homework time, to two hours or less, at least one hour of physical activity every day, and not drinking any sugar-sweetened beverages. So um, the resource guides that we have now, Albuquerque, Gallup, Farmington, Las Cruces, and Tucumcari. And along with this is what we call our shared encounter form, which helps families use this tool with their providers to um, come up with some um, action items for themselves over the summer. So to give you an example, these are updated uh, on a regular basis and soon we'll have the Roswell one completed. It's just being reviewed by some community members now. Basically, all of these things, you can, you can download it, but if you go to our website, all these things are active. So if you go... Uh, hover over the website, um, you can actually get to the website and get the information that you need um, about these programs. So that's the Zip to Health Guide. Um, and if you want to use provider resources like the Shared Encounter Form, which we have in English and Spanish, um, I'm bringing that up now. Um, this, if we have them here, they're a, a NCR form, so it has the second page. Um, but reinforcing these messages, so when a provider is working with a family, what do I choose to do? Um, what will be my challenges? And if it's not one of these things, these are just there for a reminder. It might be something else they're working on. And great for the social workers in the audience because this does not have to be done necessarily by the PCP. It can be done by anybody on the provider team and can actually reinforce some of the, the medical um, conditions that need to be managed, you know, trying to put all these things together. Because sometimes one of the things that happens is that it may be that what you choose to do is just let go of some of your anxiety for this week <laughs> or next week, and that it doesn't have anything to do with breakfast and, and lunch and dinner and activity. It has to do with the fact that you're trying to manage a chronic illness. Um, and so don't feel like you're limited by that. But it's a kind of a nice field because it's something that the family and the provider can have. And it, it gives you a place to have these discussions. What are my challenges or barriers? How will I handle it? 
who can I enroll to help me? Who are the helpers in the community or my family? And, and how will I know I'm successful and what am I going to do when I'm successful? And then reinforcing the use of um, motivational interviewing in terms of asking confidence. And one of the things that we do now, too, is importance. So even if someone picks something that they choose to do, you know, adding to that confidence scale, how important is it really? And they may say, well, you know, I picked to do this, but really what's important is something else and just mm. going there. Even if they think they're giving you the answer you want to hear, it may not be really that important to them. So hopefully you guys will find that um, useful. And that's downloadable uh, PDF from our website. So Kathleen, anything else you wanted to add? Um, no, I, I think I just want to, I guess. <laughs> it is a great website. There are tons of resources. Um, and we need to um, use resources and share with uh, parents and kids from across all um, across all professions to deal with this. And um, last, not last week, the last session, Kevin did a really great presentation on using media to intervene. And um, I believe you can see that website or that um, presentation on the website as well. And so in today's techno-savvy world, except for me, of course, um, I think you can use those materials to really um, engage kids and their families to, um, to make progress. Um, I would like to, though, see if, if anybody has had any uh, success stories that they would like to, um, to share. Uh, Kathleen, uh, a couple of things. This is Kevin Worling. First of all, thank you for that compliment. Um, also, the, the video from two weeks ago will be up uh, probably today or Monday. Um, but we do have a, a couple questions from, um, from folks out there who are uh, typing it into the questions pane. And mm -hmm. uh, so one question for you, for you Dr. Colloran, is do you also see weight gain in kids during Christmas break? Oh, now there's a great question. Um, I can't give you any solid data, but if I was going to get, if I was a betting person, I'd say, oh, yeah. <laughs> we all tend to gain weight during the, um, the winter holiday seasons just because there's more eating and usually less physical activity due to inclement weather, which is now happening in Minnesota. I'm pretty sure it's going to snow in a few minutes. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, I think, and oh, I know. <laughs> uh, is it snowing up in Red Lake? <laughs> no snow. We're just expecting some rain. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that that's probably a pretty realistic um, answer is that there is weight gain. And unfortunately, it's harder to get it off because it's still winter, and so um, a lot of people don't necessarily get it all off. Other comments on that, or does anybody have any experience to share? Okay, I think there was another question, Kevin. I uh, know. Actually, that was that was the one. If anybody that was the one. Feel free to uh, go ahead and and either ask verbally or you can type it into the um, to the questions pane and go to webinar. Okay, and then I, Clancy, I didn't know if there were any. Patient presentations. No formal cases today. And this okay. Is so, great. So, if anybody has any um, patient related questions or questions unrelated to the topic presented today, um, please feel free to ask those and, um, and we can hopefully provide some comments. It's a quiet group. Okay, so um, because it's summer and we don't want to gain weight, we're going to spend the next couple of Fridays out exercising and gardening. 
Um, and our next session will be um, June the 28th or 29th? 28th. 28th. And we are going to have a guest speaker, Dr. Ellen Kaufman, who is a pediatric endocrinologist. And she is going to um, give us an update on um, diabetes in kids. And um, if any of you know, at least in our state, she's one of a very few number of pediatric endocrinologists and um, has been practicing in New Mexico for many, many years. And since I've known her in 91, she's always been telling me she's going to retire. But now it's 2013, and she's the bomb. So I encourage you all to attend that. Uh, it's a great opportunity if you have any patients who have diabetes, type 1 or type 2 who are kids, to get expert information. Um, and it doesn't matter in what capacity you're seeing them. We, we take all and any. And if you have Molina patients, you actually get reimbursed for presenting. Um, but even that doesn't matter. So um, if there's nothing else, is there anything else? Uh, if we could just check in with everyone, and if anyone who has not, if you have not stated your name and would like CMEs or CEUs or credit, then uh, please announce your name. Okay. okay. Did we get everyone then? Well, this is Teresa Curacina, and I'm still here, so I just want you to know it was a very enjoyable uh, presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And again, I apologize for the disruption at the beginning. But thank you. Okay, then we will look forward to seeing or hearing from you um, in a few weeks. Kirsten, do you think you... Oh, good. Kirsten, can you give me a call? Yes, when you hang up. I'm assuming you're using your cell phone, so I'll call you when you hang up. Okay, you have my number? Yes. I sent you a couple of text okay. messages.